let's explore various historical concepts that have been used to uphold and validate the theory of evolution. I'm confident that these findings and key historical events which have been instrumental in shaping my own perspective will similarly assist others in questioning and ultimately rejecting this theory entirely. By discarding this obstructive theory, we can eliminate barriers that hinder our pursuit of truth, freeing ourselves from the constraints it imposes. This liberation allows us to transcend the notion that the world's diverse array of complex life forms are merely the result of time and chance. This prevailing scientific theory represents a significant obstacle, impeding our ability to move beyond the limitations of an inherently flawed naturalistic philosophy. It limits our comprehensive understanding and hinders us from embracing the profound realization that a creative force beyond comprehension has shaped the world we inhabit and is the sole author of all our experiences. To begin, I will present some of my favorite quotes that I've accumulated over the years, reflecting my own examination, consideration, and eventual rejection of this theory. Ironically, let's begin with none other than Charles Darwin himself, the renowned pioneer of the theory of evolution, who introduced his ideas in 1859 through his seminal work on the origin of species. Charles Darwin said, To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Louis Bonheur said, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Malcolm Muggeridge said, I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious a hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. Dr. Colin Patterson said, No one has ever produced a species by mechanisms of natural selection. No one has ever gotten near it, and most of the current argument in Neo-Darwinism is about this question. Adnan Oktar said, The complexity and intricacy of living organisms cannot be explained solely by chance and natural processes. There must be a higher intelligence behind their creation. The theory of evolution, formulated by Charles Darwin, posits that all species of organisms have descended from a common ancestor through gradual changes over long periods of time, encapsulated in four primary concepts. 1. Descent with modification. Species change over time, and new species arise from pre-existing ones through a process called descent with modification. 2. Natural selection. The driving force behind evolution is natural selection. Individuals with advantageous traits are more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on these traits to future generations. 3. Common ancestry. All living organisms share a common ancestry, and the diversity of life on Earth is a result of branching and diversification over millions of years. 4. Gradualism Evolution occurs gradually through the accumulation of small changes over long periods of time, leading to the formation of new species. The theory of evolution posits that the diversity and complexity of life can be explained by natural processes without the need for supernatural intervention. However, considerable doubt persists regarding the fundamental concept that one species can gradually transform into a completely different species over time. Skepticism is further fueled by historical examples that often rely on highly speculative interpretations, requiring a significant degree of faith to even be considered plausible. Instead of categorizing certain discoveries as entirely new species, or simply small variations within existing species, they are often labeled as transitional forms. This labeling is a common practice among evolutionists attempting to establish intermediate connections in the evolutionary chain. This entirely speculative process forms the foundation of the theory, suggesting, for example, how an aquatic species might undergo a gradual series of transitions over an extended period through successive generations 
ultimately becoming a land-dwelling animal. This involves a gradual process in which an organism undergoes a reduction or loss of distinct aquatic features, which become less advantageous in water, while simultaneously developing entirely new features that are specifically adapted for survival in a non-aquatic land environment. However, it is essential to recognize the inherent complexities associated with embracing this theory. The theory requires acceptance of countless leaps of faith, undergoing transitions from one form to another without providing any demonstrated biological or chemical mechanisms to explain the feasibility of such transitions. We are simply asked to play along, out of blind trust, to keep this naturalistic theory cohesive. Charles Darwin himself acknowledged the crucial importance of finding evidence of transitional forms in nature, commonly referred to as the fossil record. He conceded that without such evidence, his theory would be deemed inadequate. Despite ongoing research, there remains a significant deficiency in the fossil record, a deficiency that has consistently posed a critical obstacle to supporting this theory since its inception. When purported missing links are discovered, they have been marred by numerous instances of fraud and forgery. These historical falsifications have damaged the credibility of evolutionary theory, revealing the lengths to which some evolutionists are willing to go to support naturalistic views. While the concept of a sequential series of transitional forms may seem logical and compelling when depicted through imagery such as the well-known monkey-to-man illustration, it is crucial to acknowledge the intricate complexities and the significant challenges in plausibility connecting these transitions. This recognition points to the considerable degree of faith necessary for the theory of evolution to be firmly accepted. Throughout history, numerous instances of confirmed fraud and creative reconstructions have been aimed at attempting to identify missing links in the story of human origins. However, all attempts have ultimately failed. As we move ahead, constructing a compelling case against the theory of evolution requires us to highlight the extensive range of speculations that endeavor to support it, as well as a history replete with fraud and deception. Upon examining these cases, it becomes apparent that they stretch the limits of credibility, bordering on the impossible, and thus make it exceptionally challenging to seriously consider the validity of such claims and the overall theory. This discussion underscores the importance of conducting a comprehensive evaluation of proposed evidence, rather than simply accepting it as scientifically valid and worthy of consideration. It highlights the necessity of looking beyond persuasive illustrations and depictions that might lead us to believe we have seen conclusive proof. We should be encouraged to further examine the complete narrative before drawing firm conclusions and claiming to have thoroughly examined the evidence. Turning our attention to historical instances, there have been numerous cases where scientists and proponents of the theory of evolution have used cleverly crafted fakes, forgeries, and highly speculative assumptions in their efforts to support this naturalistic theory. These incidents underscore the need for vigilance and thorough scrutiny in scientific research, cautioning against acceptance based solely on blind trust. Proposed by German biologist Ernest Haeckel, the recapitulation theory suggested that the development of an individual organism, ontogeny, recapitulates the evolutionary history of its species, phylogeny. According to this theory, the stages of embryonic development in an organism mirror the evolutionary stages that its ancestors underwent. Modern embryology and evolutionary biology have revealed that the relationship between autogeny and phylogeny is far more complex than Haeckel proposed. Haeckel's recapitulation theory has been widely discredited and is no longer considered accurate by any of the scientific community worldwide. Ernest Haeckel's scientific work, particularly his illustrations of embryos he presented to support his recapitulation theory, faced intense criticism from his peers. Accused of manipulating and exaggerating his drawings to strengthen his recapitulation theory, Haeckel was found guilty of scientific misconduct during a trial by his peers. The verdict confirmed that his illustrations did not reflect the actual appearance of embryos. This controversy undermined Haeckel's credibility and led to a loss of support for his recapitulation theory within the scientific community. 
After his trial, Haeckel was quoted saying, After this compromising confession of forgery, I should be obliged to consider myself condemned and annihilated if I had not the consolation of seeing, side by side with me in the prisoner's dock, hundreds of fellow culprits, among them many of the most trusted observers and most esteemed biologists. The great majority of all the diagrams in the best biological textbooks, treatises, and journals would incur in the same degree the charge of forgery, for all of them are inexact, and are more or less doctored, schematized, and constructed. The first recognized Neanderthal remains were discovered in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, Germany, in 1856. Quarry workers stumbled upon a skull cap, several limb bones, and some other fragments. Interestingly enough, these discoveries were made during a period that coincided with the release of Charles Darwin's work on the origin of species. Neanderthals are claimed to be a close relative of modern humans. To this day, reconstructed drawings of this Neanderthal man are depicted in scholarly journals and textbooks, and claimed to be a missing evolutionary link. The fact is, however, that all so-called Neanderthal remains have never been shown to be any more different from modern humans than an Asian from a Caucasian, or an Inuit from an Aborigine. As well, the skull size shows its brain was 13% larger than the average brain of modern man, making it impossible to be an intermediary between modern man and ape. Even Time magazine in 1971 claimed the primitiveness of Neanderthal man to be unwarranted, that he could walk the street unrecognized. One writer even commenting that historians of the future may declare all of us insane for not detecting and refuting this incredible blunder with adequate determination. One of the main proponents pushing Neanderthal man as an authentic species was Reiner Proch, a German anthropologist and former professor who gained attention for his involvement in a scientific fraud related to Neanderthal remains. Prosch claimed to have discovered and analyzed several important Neanderthal fossils, including the famous Heidelberg man. However, it was later revealed that Prosch had manipulated the dating of these fossils and provided inaccurate information about their age. Investigations into Prosch's work uncovered numerous irregularities and inconsistencies. It was found that Prosch had engaged in fraudulent practices, such as misrepresenting the origin and age of the fossils. As a result, his scientific reputation was severely damaged, and his work came under intense scrutiny. In the early 20th century, fossil specimens were discovered on the Indonesian island of Java by Dutch physician and paleontologist Eugene Dubois. It is worth noting that Dubois had previously studied as an apprentice under Ernest Haeckel, the evolutionist involved in the elaborate hoaxes previously outlined. Dubois claimed to have found significant remains at the Trinil site along the Solo River, including a skull cap, a leg bone, a jaw fragment, and three teeth. Initially, he named the fossil Pithecanthropus erectus, suggesting it represented an intermediary form between apes and humans, from which he constructed the ape-like Java Man. Within ten years of its discovery, Java Man was the main subject of over eighty evolution books and articles, and was eventually named Homo erectus. Hank Hanagraf, author and talk show host, wrote, Interestingly, some of the teeth were old and some young. The bones belonged to ape, female and male. It was an interesting conglomeration, and the reason that people didn't catch on to it is because the find of Dubois was kept from scholars for about thirty years. He also withheld the discovery of modern human remains, which were found in the same stratum as Java Man. Of course, that would have ruined his claims that Java Man was the ancestor of modern-day humans. Finally, enough pressure was placed on him that the actual bones were allowed to be examined, and the discrepancies were found, and eventually, enlightened America, as well as the world, found out that this was a hoax. Java Man's teeth were discovered to be of varying ages, and the bones were a combination of human and ape remains, including a large gibbon's skull. Rudolf Virchow, who was Ernest Haeckel's own professor and the leading pathology expert of his era, made the following statement. In my opinion, this creature was an animal, a giant gibbon in fact, 
and the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. Many experts, including himself, reached the conclusion that the thigh bone is undoubtedly human, whereas the skull cap and teeth are attributed to a primate. The story of Piltdown Man revolves around a notorious archaeological hoax that occurred in the early 20th century. The discovery took place in 1912 in Piltdown, England, when Charles Dawson, an amateur archaeologist, claimed to have found remains of an ancient hominid. The findings were presented as a missing link between apes and humans, garnering significant attention from the scientific community. The supposed Piltdown Man fossils included a human-like skull with an ape-like jaw, along with various other bone fragments and teeth. The discovery initially received widespread acceptance and was seen as a breakthrough in understanding human evolution at the time. However, suspicions about the authenticity of Piltdown Man arose in the following decades. In 1953, the Piltdown Man specimens were revealed to be an elaborate forgery. In 1953, the fossils were conclusively identified as a composite of ancient human skull fragments, an orangutan jaw, and chimpanzee teeth, molars and premolars, that were filed down to make them appear more human-like. As well, the bones were chemically treated and stained to match an aged appearance. It became clear that the deception was meticulously planned and executed. The Piltdown Man hoax had a significant impact on the field of paleoanthropology. The identity of the hoaxer remains uncertain, with Charles Dawson being the primary suspect, although others may have been involved. In 1922, a single tooth was discovered in Nebraska's Snake Creek Formation. Some scientists, including Henry Fairfield Osborne, an American paleontologist, and the president of the American Museum of Natural History from 1908 to 1933, speculated that it belonged to an early human ancestor. Osborne even provided an artistic reconstruction of what Nebraska man and his wife and child might have looked like, based on a single tooth, highlighting again what was mentioned prior about extensive range of speculations. However, further excavations and research revealed that the tooth actually belonged to an extinct pig-like mammal rather than a human ancestor. The misidentification of the tooth as evidence for human evolution underscores yet another instance of premature and rather extreme speculation based on limited evidence. This highlights the pervasive nature of such attempts throughout history to establish supposed missing links in the human evolutionary chain. Lucy was discovered in 1974 in the Afar region of Ethiopia by paleoanthropologist Donald Johansson and his team. The discovery represented a relatively complete skeleton of an alleged early human ancestor claimed to have lived approximately 3.2 million years ago. Lucy belonged to the species Australopithecus afarensis, which displayed a combination of ape-like and human-like characteristics and was claimed to walk upright. There have been numerous controversies and debates surrounding Lucy's classification and significance. For example, there were claims that Johansson did not allow other scientists to examine Lucy's bones until 1982, eight years after the discovery. Some argue that as more Australopithecus skeletons have been found and examined, many leading evolutionists now consider Lucy to be simply an extinct type of ape similar to modern pygmy chimpanzees, rather than a direct human ancestor. In May 1999, the French Science AV magazine ran a cover story titled Goodbye, Lucy. The article discussed how Lucy, once considered the most famous fossil of Australopithecus, was no longer seen as the root of the human race, and, quote, needs to be removed from the supposed human family tree. In 1982, a fragment of a skull known as Orse Man was discovered in the Spanish town of Orse. Initially believed to be from a human ancestor dating back approximately 1.8 million years, the skull fragment later failed to substantiate its highly speculative claims of such antiquity. Subsequent studies and re-evaluation of the fossil indicated that it is more likely to have belonged to an ancient donkey rather than a human ancestor. The precise identification of the fragment remains a subject of ongoing scientific debate and investigation. 
the Orse skull discovery, once thought to be a significant finding related to early humans, is now considered more likely to be associated with other extinct animals, or potentially an artifact of geological processes. The theory of evolution as an explanation for macroevolution, wherein one species can transition into a distinctly new species, has never been directly observed. Instead, the observable evidence supports microevolution, which refers to small changes within a species based on subtle variations, such as gradual adaptations in beak sizes among birds. It is important to recognize that microevolution operates within a very limited framework and remains the extent of what has been scientifically confirmed to date. Throughout history, evolutionists have made persistent efforts, many times fraudulent as we have seen, to attempt to bridge highly implausible gaps within the theory of evolution. These attempts aim to establish it as a valid and scientifically supported explanation for the gradual evolution of simple single-celled organisms into the diverse and complex array of life forms we observe all around us today. Perhaps there is no greater illustration of the profound complexities involved than the process of a single sperm cell merging with an egg, setting in motion the remarkable journey that leads to the creation of an entire human being. Attempting to reverse engineer such complex mechanisms highlights the vast chasms of understanding that must still be traversed to scientifically support evolutionary concepts. Consider the multitude of wonders that ensue. The intricate complexities of eyes that perceive the world, ears that capture the symphony of sound, an olfactory system that distinguishes the subtlest of scents, a robust skeletal framework that provides structure, a circulatory system that coordinates the flow of vital substances along with a meticulously interconnected nervous system culminating in a fully conscious brain at the center. The complexity of it all seems boundless, leaving us in awe of the wondrous enigma that life presents and how it could possibly come into being, especially if attempting to explain this through evolutionary processes rather than a creative author at work. I sincerely hope you will consider embracing the perspective of intelligent and purposeful design, rather than solely relying on speculative science or placing unwavering trust in processes driven purely by chance and coincidence, even across vast expanses of time.